Welcome to this week's episode of The Shittest Show on YouTube. A bunch of people have been asking me what the weird noise is in the background. Hey! Ah! Did you knock it off? Fuck <sighs> off. Should be right now. For this week's shit questions, I've only got one. It's actually a long one. I got a question. You know, when you start talking, you sound like fucking Kermit. I got a go, oh, I got a go, oh. <clears throat> I got a question. Fuck me. I got a question a week or so back from T Bomb Troy that I feel like is really asking, how do I tell if I'm delusional around how successful my music can be and what generates that success? Is it the end product or is it something else I need to be doing like marketing and promotion? Hopefully you, you agree with my uh, paraphrasing T-bomb. So I reckon more often than not, the answers we really need come from asking different questions to what we often find ourselves asking. Fucking think about that one. Last episode, I shared my theory that preparation is actually more important than luck when it comes to success and that you need to define success in order to retrofit a path to reach it. Then you can objectively ascertain whether your actions meet your intentions and clarify what you're labeling as success like it's a destination. And then you'll know when you get there. Otherwise, you're just fucking flittering about into space with no form, shape or color. And that can be quite unsettling especially when you wake up one day and realize you're old and start believing some story as to why you weren't one of the lucky ones. Probably sounds a bit cynical, but uh, well, 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 well. Personally, I don't think I've reached my destination and uh, maybe I never will. So what I'm doing here is just sharing my thought process. Take it with a grain of shit. Take it with a grain of shit. T-Bomb Troy's original wording was, I know that when I am involved in creating something, a song or whatever, there is that joy of sharing that with others, taking what you've made and saying, hey, look at this, to anyone that is even vaguely interested. I can only imagine how wonderful it must be for you to look out into a crowd of people dancing and singing along to the songs that you and the boys have written, or to know that at any given moment, there are those waiting to hear your latest creations, thoughts or ideas, or to even have a chance to chat like this on Facebook. But I'm wary of coming across like, a new parent that backs unsuspecting people against the wall and shows endless photos of their new baby. <laughs> She's so cute, I love children. Look at my kids. Because I know that there is a chance the specialness of what I've created is mainly because I made it, not because it's actually great in its own context. I love the drawings my kids make for me because of the relationship I share with them, but I'm not gonna send them out to art critics thinking that they will have the same connection. Don't get me started on critics, by the way. It's easier to be a critic than a creator, but I can relate to what you're saying here and I, I wanna actually share a little story. When I was a bit younger, I used to get pissed off at how much AFL footy players earn when I was struggling to make a living out of music. So I used to think that what they earned correlated to their skills and time investment into acquiring those skills, com comparatively to music, uh, might not seem uh, fair, but it's not really the entire picture. Um, I, 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 I also fucking hated post-game interviews. Yeah, the boy. Look, yeah, look, the boys really brought their A game tonight, and uh, the best team won. You know, I'm the last one to make excuses, but Wayno's hammy really put a dent in the game plan. Ch chalk that one up in the win column. We knew what we had to do, and we went out and did that. Jono puts in 110%, mate. Jono puts in 100%, and then finds another 10% from somewhere else and chucks that into the, into it. Yeah, they're mentally tough, and uh, you know, we just lost our legs. Fanger is just a natural born leader. It's do or die. Yeah, we're just taking one game at a time. As a team, we never forget where we've come from. He's all heart, mate. Look, a win is a win. Monkey's off our back and morale's high. Yeah, I mean, that last two minutes felt like a lifetime. He's got unlimited potential. I mean, if he wanted to be a bit of spaghetti, he bloody could. Yeah, it just doesn't get any better than this. You can't teach it, and you can't learn it. We had to focus today because, you know, for the boys, there was no tomorrow. Nobody bloody, no, nobody bloody believed in us, so I I hope this changes some minds. Yeah, they, they just wanted more. Ah, uh, I am gutted. I'm gutted. Demo's in a league of his own, and I know he silenced his critics tonight. We all have the philosophy that, you know, we play to win. 
Both teams played their hearts out tonight. The field is full of eviscerated hearts. Every training, whackers, first in and last to leave. I'm telling you this because I think this is how a lot of creatives think, especially musicians. And the equation is often, I've put in X, Y, Z time into hone my skills. Now I'm entitled to a proportionate remuneration from the universe. I think this is a flawed way of thinking and I'll share with you how my mind changed about this. <laughs> so let's go back to the footy. An adult ticket is 27 bucks. Concession tickets are 18 bucks. Kids tickets are six bucks. So for argument's sake, let's round the ticket price to the mean value of $17 and then round up to $20 because there's probably more adults than kids going to AFL games. There's 18 teams. Each team has 22 players. So there's around 396 individual players per season. 36 players combined per game because each team can only have 18 per side on the field playing or not. And there's between 22 and 25 games per season depending on who gets into the finals. Around 7.5 million people attended games last year, paying an average of $20 a head. That's around 150 million gross, not counting food and drinks sold at games, merch, television advertisers, pay-per-views, or deducting any overheads. <sighs> 396 players on the payroll times the average wage of 309,000 per player equals 122 million in wages. Highest paid players capped at 12.4 million. So you could say that 396 players generate on average almost 19,000 ticket sales each. Someone's probably gonna pull me up on this math, but I think it's solid. So imagine we were talking about musicians all playing in five piece bands. That's about 79 bands worth of players. So 79 bands playing around 23 gigs a year each and each band pulls a crowd of 95,000 per gig. So thinking like that, it doesn't really matter how long it takes to be a great footy player or how much of a fucking caveman you are at interviews. People want to watch football in person and on TV. This attracts advertisers, sells merchandise, and it generates a fuck ton of money. Comparing footy and music is like chalk and cheese in a lot of ways. My point is whether you're a concert violinist or a fucking crackhead playing a bucket with a rubber chicken, if you can pull a crowd of paying customers, you're doing something right. So some pertinent questions. How many people come and watch your band and who are they? Are they friends and family supporting you? Are they other bands you frequently play with? Are they the friends and family of the other bands that you frequently play with? How many people are complete strangers? Punters. And of those people, who brought your merch or signed up to your mailing list of their own free will? What other metrics can you use to work out if you're converting people who are at your shows into fans? If this is not happening on some level each time you play, then maybe what you're doing isn't compelling enough. The other weird thing to consider is that when you go to an AFL game, you expect quality football and elite players. Bazaar, the overweight butcher from fucking Broad Meadows, isn't going out and having a crack with elite athletes. Whether or not Baza would love to do that or not, or whether it's Baza's dream and all he thinks about has very little influence on whether the crowd would feel good about forking out their hard earned 27 bucks to watch some unfit fat bloke tick a box on his bucket list. Even if the gimmick amused some people, others wouldn't appreciate the disruption to their reasonable expectations considering what they've paid for. Venues are not philanthropic patrons of the arts charged to facilitate the dreams of musicians. They're businesses that need to pay staff, they have overheads, so they need to sell alcohol and get people in the door. If you expect a cheese platter on your rider just because you graduated from music school with honors, unless you can get people through the door, it really doesn't matter. As they say, a harsh truth is better than a false hope and feel free to disagree. So back to T-Bomb. I'm supposed to be T-Bomb. Boom. T-Bomb says, I used to think that if you just wrote good songs, so I'd stop you there. What is a good song? That is another can of worms. And when I say worms, I mean exogorth size worms. <laughs> then everything will work out and you find yourself on stage in front of people who actually came to see you play. But I can only imagine the number of bands that I would love but have never heard of because for whatever reason their music didn't reach me. So I think the heart of the question is, how do you know how hard to share what you have with others and in what ways? I'm just worried that the integrity of the project may be tainted if I'm just that dude spamming pages with links to his songs. I'm presuming the subtext here is that your band might fit that description for other people as it does for you. This is not personal because I've never heard your band or I don't know you personally, but simulate what would happen if an electric guitar player started co consistently uploading videos to YouTube that they filmed on an iPhone freaking six. Their playing was comparable in ability 
to Guthrie Govan, do you think they'd go undiscovered or would people start taking notice pretty quickly? I think the latter. How do you know how hard to share what you have with others and in what ways? What I think you're describing is referred to as push marketing or interruption marketing, which is a remnant from the sales era dating back to the 1920s. Um, and it pretty much died in the 1990s. So consider instead of pushing, you need to start pulling. That means you create something that draws people to you, something remarkable, which is an, another way of saying worthy of remark. I don't even think it's possible to ram shit down people's throats and have them like it these days. They have to find something remarkable about it themselves. Uh, T-Bomb said, I'm just worried that the integrity of the project may be tainted if I'm just that dude spamming pages with links to his songs. I'd say your instinct is correct. My advice would be not to do that. If anyone thinks that works, I don't agree. The best thing you can do is focus on making the best song you can, not plural. No one wants to hear 12 shit songs. Just like no one wants to eat a whole barrel of gelati before they decide if they deviate from their usual flavor. They try out new flavors on tiny smurfed size, like little smurfed size spoons. Unless you're servicing an existing audience, I would resist the temptation to have long chorus laden atmospheric intros. Get to the point and do your best, not what you're comfortable doing and think about the difference between those two things. I did my best or I did what I was comfortable doing. Then after that, if, if no one gives a fuck, do it again, try harder, practice, learn about songwriting, think about the lyrics, which is another can of exogorths. Anyway, enough about that. Time for a Fatality. All right, maybe I'll change this segment. <laughs> Up the first episode, hopefully those fatalities got easier to do. Correct, they did. All right, I think I know what to do. Here we go. Yeah, that'll do. Um, shit blair, I'll call that. Shit blair. I had other things planned, but I think I've run out of time because it's quarter to eight and I need to edit this motherfucker. Hope you've enjoyed this week's episode, a bit more serious than usual, but uh, subscribe. Tell your fucking friends. It's a weird thing, isn't it? That concludes episode four of Stevic's YouTube shit show. Tune in next week for another episode. Be a bit different to this one, I think, because I'm going away, so I won't have time to do stuff. I had a lot planned, but I ran out of time. Stay shit. <laughs>